All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this presentation. Um, I will uh, be giving this presentation to describe the results of a project where we investigated how to change certain crop production practices in order to obtain better pest control in greenhouse ornamentals. So that's basically what the title is. Um, before I go into any details about the project, I'd like to introduce the whole research team, including Omar for Floriculture Specialist, Sarah Jan Dwissik and Siobhan Debel, and the violent technicians Ashley and Zelda, who did most of the experimental work. So these are the people who made it all happen. I'm just the one talking about it. So to set up this presentation and to, to kind of uh, situate, where, um, tell you about uh, the situation. In the province of Ontario, about 94, basically the majority of floriculture growers use biological control. And for the majority of them, biological control is actually their primary IPM strategy. And the driving factor behind this was that they have very few viable chemical options to control threats. There's a few, but biocontrol really is, is the first option that they try and they keep the chemicals uh, for when things get out of hand. So this is an infographic that we put together based on the IPM strategies that growers use and also the research that we've done over the past 10 years. It describes, uh, as you can see here, the use of predatory mites, um, biopesticides, uh, other predators here, um, nematodes, and mass trapping as well. And over the course of this presentation, I want to show the value of adding two more strategies, such as cutting dips and plant resilience to the system. Both of these strategies are implemented at early intervention points based on the principles of starting clean and staying clean. Uh, and this graph shows the model that we want to test. So the red line represents a conventional scenario. So where we start out with some pests at the beginning of the production cycle and the pests steadily increase over time. Now from our previous research, we know that cutting dips can lower pest numbers right at the start. So that's this, uh, this green arrow right here. Um, however, if you do not do anything else except cutting dips, of course, pest numbers may increase again. However, cutting dips do buy enough time for the biocontrol agents to start working. When they're released right at planting, they need this little bit of time to start working and to establish. So first I'll show you some background and some results on cutting dips, and then I'll talk about plant resilience in the second part of this presentation. So for those of you who are not familiar with cutting dips, I will quickly describe the procedure. Uh, from the pictures uh, on the left here, you'll see that you'll take the cuttings out of the bag, spread them loosely in a perforated tray, then cover this tray with a second tray and completely immerse the trays into the dip solution. For small quantities or really tiny cuttings, some people prefer to use a colander or a sieve. The goal anyway is to get complete coverage of the cuttings. Now the products that we have investigated as dips were basically biopesticides or reduced risk products such as oils and soap. The reason is these products have less issues with pesticide resistance, they leave minimal residues and are also highly compatible with biocontrol agents. Now after the cuttings are dipped, they are stuck in the substrate and just grown as usual. So our previous work on cutting dips was all done on Bemisia whiteflies on poinsettia cuttings. And uh, we got really good results with this system. A grant by the American Flora Endowment and further funding by the third COHA cluster now allowed us to expand our research to thrips because if it works for whitefly, of course, the next pest we want to tackle is thrips. And in particular, we wanted to know uh, how many thrips are actually coming in on imported and locally grown cuttings so that we can assess how much of a benefit dips can actually uh, give growers. We determined the efficacy and the phytotoxicity of different products used as cutting dips against thrips. And also uh, we wanted to validate cutting dips for control of Western flower thrips in commercial greenhouse crops. So to start with, uh, do thrips come in on cuttings? 
In 2018, we did very extensive monitoring of chrysanthemum cuttings that arrived at local greenhouses. And we found that 84% of the samples were invested with thrips. It was not many, I mean, about one to two thrips per sample of 20 cuttings and were mostly eggs and larvae. There was very little variation among cultivars and time of year. So basically every variety we looked at, at any time of the year, we found a few thrips. We also sampled other crops like spring bedding plants like Montana, Calabacoa, Verbena, Agomia, and Impatience. And, uh, but this was a much more smaller sample size and we found some thrips even on these crops as well. Uh, in some, not in others, some shipments, not others. Now our goal was to look for thrips in the chrysanthemum cuttings, but we also found that almost half of the chrysanthemum samples also had two spotted spider mites. Their numbers ranged from a few to over a hundred mites of all developmental stages per sample of 20 cuttings. So infestations were quite variable. Sometimes there were a lot, sometimes there were none uh, and inconsistent, making this more of like a hit or miss situation. But you'll see why uh, I will talk about spider mites later on as well. So I hope you're not watching this on your phone because this slide is, uh, has a lot of information and is very small. But basically, <laughs> I tried to summarize the most important results on dip efficacy and phytotoxicity of, the, uh, of several products that could be used for dipping. And I included the results for Bemisia, thrips, and spider mites. So um, you can see that I make a difference between hardy crops and sensitive crops based on the phytotoxic effects of the products and the rates. For example, the rates for soap and oil had to be lowered very much in order not to damage sensitive plant species such as poinsettia and mini roses, but they were still effective, these rates. Um, so I indicate this with like a, a yellow triangle with a plant with no leaves. So that means uh, do not use this rate, it's phytotoxic. And you can see for the hardy plants, um, it's not phytotoxic. Luckily for each pest and plant combination, we did find a product and a rate that was effective. So these are the dark green cells. And in general, we saw mortality between 70 and over 95%. Um, just note that the, the high rate of Botanigard here, uh, we only tested in a greenhouse. So I don't have an exact number for it, but it worked very well. So I just said high efficacy. We knew from our Bemisia work um, right here, this graph, that combining cutting dips with biocontrol resulted in the best control overall. And we found the same outcome in our trials on thrips. That's why these, all these graphs look very much alike. Um, we had an unintended infestation with spider mites, so we also got results for this pest, uh, kind of like a little bonus. Uh, so in these graphs, the blue lines represent the no-dip treatments, uh, with or without biocontrol. So dotted is with biocontrol and solid line is no biocontrol. And then um, the yellow and red lines represent the different dip treatments, either with um, Botanigard uh, or with um, landscape oil uh, for these two graphs right here. Um, and basically all graphs, as I said, show the same results. Dips with biocontrol work the best. Um, except here um, we see that uh, Botanigar dips do not kill spider mites. And finally, we set up commercial greenhouse trials early last year, 2020, uh, in ivy geranium and verbena, but then COVID struck and we had to try and finish the trials by bringing the cuttings to Vineland. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, the results were not really conclusive. In some replicates, we did see thrips reduction after dipping the cuttings in soft oil, and in other reps, we did not. So that's something we may have to uh, repeat at some point in time. But overall, the project has led to dipping being added to product labels as an application method. Uh, in Canada, we have landscape oil, Botanigard, Copa, and soft oil X on the labels. And in the US, we have Botanic Art. Um, and the uptake by Ontario growers is also really high. Uh, a survey in 2018 um, showed that 74% of poinsettia growers actually dipped their cuttings. So, uh, and I think that number is only growing with all the outreach that we're doing. 
So if you want to know more about cutting dips and the research we did, um, here are two videos that you may find helpful. Uh, we made a short video explaining all the important steps of cutting dips. And also uh, all the research is summarized in a recorded webinar. So continuing with our model on early intervention points, I now would like to talk about plant resilience. As I said before, in this uh, model graph, the red line represents a convention conventional scenario. And by dipping the green arrow, we can knock down these pest populations to win time for the biocontrol agents to start working. Plant resilience means that finding a way to make plants less susceptible or more resistant to pests. Uh, when plants are less suitable hosts for pests, you slow down their population growth. Uh, and this is represented by the blue uh, arrow and blue line, which makes it easier again for biocontrol agents to manage these pests. And one of the ways that could, this could be done is by optimizing plant nutrition to benefit the plant, but not the pests. Especially nitrogen has been identified as an important nutrient for insect uh, feeding. This diagram um, from a, a paper shows how nitrogen moves through the plant and where and how it is stored. So from the bottom up, there are the roots, the mature leaves and the shoots. So nitrogen is taken up in the roots as nitrate and ammonium and transported through the plant, mainly as amino acids through the xylem and the phloem. This is the flaw right here. Nitrogen can also be stored as inorganic nitrogen, again, uh, nitrate and um, ammonium, or as organic nitrogen, amino acids and proteins. And the forms of nitrogen that are important for pests is the organic nitrogen, the amino acids and proteins. And white flies, as indicated here, feed on the phloem sap and thrips feed on uh, the cell contents. So this means that by manipulating the amount and type of fertilizer we give to the crop, we can potentially change the plant's nutritional value for pest insects. And especially in floriculture, there is room to play with fertilizer rates because we know that floriculture crops are often over fertilized. Recent research in the same COA cluster by Dr. Shelp from the University of Guelph shows that in chrysanthemum, reductions in nitrogen of up to 75% are possible compared to conventional rates without affecting plant quality. Um, and these pictures illustrate uh, that these have all had different rates of fertilizer, but they look all the same. And studies by Dr. Zhang, also from the University of Guelph, show similar results for mini roses and potted gerber. So our hypothesis going into this research was that reduced fertilizer given to the plants will slow down pest population increase and lead to better biocontrol performance. But you can also reduce nutrients too much, which will, of course will negatively impact plant quality. So biostimulants, which are beneficial bacteria, beneficial fungi or their extracts, may mitigate these negative effects by helping plants deal with reduced nutrients. And at the same time, several biostimulants can induce the plant to produce defense compounds against pests and diseases or release volatiles that attract natural enemies, which can also, of course, reduce or slow down pest populations. So we were very interested in seeing if we could integrate biostimulants into this system. So to recap, these considerations led to the following research objectives. First, we wanted to see if it was possible to optimize nutrient inputs and biostimulant amendments to reduce the risk of pest outbreaks, while of course maintaining plant health and quality. And then we wanted to see what the effects were of reduced nutrients and or biostimulants on biocontrol efficiency. So we chose two model systems representing major floriculture crops. Uh, the first was potted gerbera that we uh, infested with greenhouse whiteflies, and the other one was potted chrysanthemum with western flower thrips. We set up two greenhouses with fertilizer tanks, as you can see in this picture here, and dosatrons, so that we could have five different fertilizer rates. And instead of just varying the nitrogen, we chose to vary the complete fertilizer rate. So just take the normal fertilizer recipe and cut it. Uh, in uh, uh, either half or certain percentages. 
as this is what we think closer to what an actual grower would do. We set up cages with several chrysanthemum or Gerbera plants, and these were hooked up to the different uh, fertilizer treatments and infested with either white flies or thrips, depending on um, which crop we had. The plants were grown using conventional production practices, including pinching, applying growth regulator, blackouts to induce flowering, and at budding, especially for the chrysanthemums, the fertilizer was switched off, which again is normal practice. The cages were sampled at four points during the production cycle from cutting to flowering to determine pest numbers. And finally, the experiment was repeated over time, either twice for Gerberas or three times for chrysanthemums. So to know if the fertilizer treatments actually change the nutrient levels in the plants, we sent samples away for sap analysis at each sampling date. And we chose to analyze the sap instead of the more common tissue analysis, because this is what the white flies and thrips ingest when they're feeding on the phloem and cell contents. This graph, the very colorful graph, shows the results of the sap analysis for organic nitrogen. So these are the amino acids and the proteins that we think are most important for insect nutrition. The colors represent the different fertilizer rates at 25, 50, 100, 150, and 200 ppm of nitrogen. And you can see that we succeeded in creating increasing levels of organic nitrogen in the plants over time. The picture here shows that around 100 ppm of nitrogen, the Gerbera quality started to suffer. Now, of course, we want to know, most important is uh, the effect of the different fertilizer treatments on white fly populations on the Gerbera plants. So here you see at four different time points, uh, this is uh, two weeks after a transplant, five weeks, um, eight weeks, and at full flower at around 10 weeks. The different colors again represent the different fertilizer treatments. The ANOVA table at the bottom here shows that the only factor that was significantly different was time, which means that white fly populations increased over time. Well, that's no surprise there. Although white fly numbers seem to be related to the organic nitrogen concentration in plants, I mean, you can see them going up a little bit. You might suspect there may be an effect. This effect was not significantly different among treatments. We suspect that for white flies, the plant nutrient levels only act on things like development time, number of eggs a female can produce, and the life cycle of white flies is quite long compared to the crop cycle of potted Gerberas to see any effect. So this probably this timeline represents only two generations of white flies. So if there's any effects, uh, it may show not show up in this time. So even if plant nutrition may not directly affect white fly population growth in a significant way, it may still have indirect effects. Um, literature suggests that insects may be better able to resist infection by entomopathogens when they feed on a diet that is high in nitrogen. And this slide shows the experiment that we did to see if there was any effect uh, in our system. And we used the entomopathogenic fungus Bovaria bassiana. For this, we grew Gerbera plants at two different fertilizer levels. 50 ppm is a limiting rate, while 200 ppm is kind of commercial practice. Plants were invested with white flies in clip cages, and then treatments were applied when the white flies were about second to third in star nymphs. The Botanigard was applied at full label rate and at lower rates, just in case white flies would be able to resist better when challenged with less spores. And the graph at the bottom left shows white fly mortality 11 days after treatment. Uh, in the control, there's very little white fly mortality, but unfortunately, all the other treatments, even 10% of the recommended rate of Botanigard, we don't see any meaningful differences among treatments and also no effect of reduced nutrients on white fly susceptibility. So switching to our second model system, chrysanthemum infested with thrips. So again, uh, the same methods, uh, here this slide shows that we succeeded in establishing increasing levels of organic nitrogen in the plants by irrigating them with different fertilizer rates. 
In this case, we use 25, 50, 100, 200, and 300 parts per million of nitrogen. And the picture again shows that around here, around 100 ppm plant uh, quality was again affected. Now this graph shows the effect of the different fertilizer treatments on FRIPS populations on the chrysanthemum plants at, again at four different points in the production cycle. First uh, samples was done at pinching, then uh, when the plants started short days, uh, third at budding and the fourth at flowering. The different colors again represent the fertilizer treatments. Um, the ANOVA table here at the bottom uh, shows that only the factor time was again significant, meaning again that thrips populations increased over time and that's what thrips do very well. However, the factor treatments, the fertilizer treatments was close to being significant at 0 0.0889. And this means we could consider it a trend, a marginal effect of fertilizer treatment on thrips populations. The high variability in the results is probably due to environmental factors. Uh, because even if we did the trials in the greenhouse, the conditions in winter and summer were very different when we repeated uh, to get more replicates. So instead of repeating the fertilizer trial several times, we actually had to go on to test the effects of biostimulants. And as the chrysanthemum thrifts model system showed most promise, we continued with this system. So the setup of this experiment was to test the effect of biostimulants on the limiting 50 ppm and non-limiting 200 ppm fertilizer conditions. As you may remember, plant quality started to suffer at around 100 ppm, so 50 ppm was really a limiting rate. We tested two different sets of treatments, uh, one with mycorrhizae with or without Bacillus subtilis, and one with microbial extracts applied at different intervals. The rest of the setup was very similar to the fertilizer experiment where we took samples at four different times during the production cycle to measure nutrient levels, plant characteristics, and thrips numbers. And this experiment was repeated for a total of eight replicates. So let's first look at the effect of biostimulants on plant quality. We again confirmed, or sorry, we confirmed that the mycorrhizae colonized the roots, especially at low fertilizer levels, and the presence of Bacillus subtilis was also confirmed. There was some effect of the mycorrhizae leading to increased root length, but overall the biostimulants did not compensate for the low fertilizer treatment. The only effects on plant quality were due to fertilizer rate. So at high fertilizer, plants had more dense foliage, higher foliage mass, and more flowers. And at low fertilizer, plants had longer roots and higher root mass. With regards to thrips populations, we did not see any effect of biostimulant treatment at either low or high fertilizer. So we did not know, do any metabolite analysis or volatile measures. We don't know if any defenses were induced or if the volatile profile of the plant was changed. But even if so, the, the effect on thrips populations were not visible. Contrary to the fertilizer trial, where we only saw a trend uh, effect of fertilizer, in both biostimulant experiments, we actually did see that thrips populations were larger in association with high fertilizer rates compared to their low fertilizer um, chrysanthemums, uh, which is represented here in the graphs. Uh, this one is uh, basically all data taken overall. And this is uh, the second experiment where the differences showed up at the end. So based on the project results until now, we can only give recommendations about cutting dips. And it is clear that dipping unrooted cuttings reduces pest populations and increases the success of an IPM program. With regards to optimizing plant nutrition to reduce the risk of pest outbreaks, we're not ready to give any recommendations yet. We saw that within the timeframe of a potted Gerbera production cycle, plant nutrition had no effect on whitefly populations, nor on whitefly susceptibility to a biopesticide. It is possible that there is an effect on white flat populations in a longer term crop like cut gerbera. 
Also, when you take the results from both fertilizer trials and the biostimulant trials for thrips, we saw a possible effect of plant nutrition on thrips populations um, in the range of between 30 to 50 percent. Unfortunately, the biostimulants had only a slight effect on plant quality and no effect on thrips under these experimental conditions. So thinking about these results and these conclusions, um, we compared them to uh, some of the trials uh, in the literature. And the results we got from our trials are actually quite similar to other studies. Here below you see um, a few graphs from a few papers um, that also show about a 30% reduction uh, in uh, thrips populations uh, at the similar fertilizer rates as we used in different crops. So um, this one was in roses, um, this one was in gerbras, and I think this one was in chrysan cut chrysanthemum. Um, so I think one of the reasons uh, is also that you tend to see only published studies with good results. The ones with bad results don't tend to get published. So it's actually the tip of the iceberg that you see. It is very likely that the effects of plant nutrition depend um, on plant species, variety, environmental factors like temperature, substrate, irrigation. And also our experiments were basically a black box. We varied the inputs and measured the outputs, but we have no idea exactly what was happening in the plant with regards to defense metabolites, other metabolites, apart from the nutrient levels. And finally, our study varied complete fertilizer rate, so we don't know what would have happened if we would have changed only individual nutrients, which is uh, maybe food for more studies. And the same thing can be said about biostimulants. Just because in our study we did not see the biostimulants compensate for limiting nutrient conditions, doesn't mean that they will never do so. Uh, in our study and in previous projects, we have seen that effects of biostimulants are complex and that effects may depend again on things like plant species, variety, environment, substrate, and type and rate of fertilizer. So it may very well be that our trials were too short or the nutrients too much limiting, not limiting enough, or that we would have found different results with a different product. It's difficult to say, because we don't know what was really going on in the plant. But overall, even if our results didn't show that pests were necessarily affected, uh, I think there's still a lot of merit and shown by um, the, the previous work that I was showing that uh, the current production guides recommend more nitrogen than is needed. So growers can think about uh, using less uh, fertilizer or less nitrogen so they can save money on fertilizer at least. And same for biostimulants. Um, biostimulants also play a role in disease suppression and many other functions. So um, there are many things um, that, uh, would rec that would uh, make a case for biostimulants. So although we are three years into the project, we still have quite a lot of things to do. As we did for whiteflies, we still want to see what happens when we combine reduced plant nutrition with biological control. And this part of the project uh, is funded by the American Flora Endowment and is currently going on. Instead of doing more greenhouse trials, we want to go back to the lab and look at the effect of plant nutrition on thrips biology on the more controlled conditions. And we also want to look what happens if we use different chrysanthemum varieties. And finally, if we manage to formulate recommendations based on these trials, we want to validate the combined effects of cutting dips and fertilizer reduction in commercial greenhouses and compare them to conventional growing practices and do a cost-benefit analysis. So I hope I gave you a, a snapshot of uh, what's going on, the results until now, and uh, hopefully food for thought and discussion. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who worked very hard on this project, recognize the funding partners, and also thank you for listening. Um, here we, I put up my email address. So if you um, don't have the opportunity to ask a question or think of any later on, you can always contact me as well. 
So with that, I would like to open it up um, to the q and I don't know, uh, I'll stop sharing so that I can at least see all the Zoom stuff. Um, let's first see if there were any um, questions in the Q&A or Carrie, I saw you put up your hand. Was there anything you wanted to mention? Sorry, that was an accidental hand raise. Apologies, okay. Rose. <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> okay, so let's first um, go to the q and I think maybe um, my helpers, Zelda and Ashley, can you see if, tell me if there were any questions? Hi, Rose. Um, yeah, somebody did, did ask a question about um, whether there's any information about whether you had information about the effects of uh, nitrogen rates on aphid outbreaks, um, which, you know, I replied that, of course, we didn't see that in our study since they're inside cages. Uh, but I thought perhaps you have come across some of this when you were looking through the literature. Sure. So there is um, there are studies uh, on the effect of nitrogen on aphids and aphids are a very uh, good organism to study this on because they have a fast uh, life cycle and they feed on the phloem. So um, uh, there's a direct um, uh, connection to like the, the nitrogen levels in the plant. Um, if you're interested, I can either send some of these studies to you um, or uh, you can um, look it up. Uh, in the literature. 